So thank you. I'd also like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and their ongoing and continuing ownership of the land and the culture that we live in. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm probably going to be a little bit... I'm going to shift it up a bit for us more tall, more normal-sized people. What do you reckon? Um, I'm going to be a little ca more casual around it, and I know that there probably is some... Which button do you press, mate? The up one? Oh, just the button. Yeah, the big one. On that one. All right. Uh, Tony, you did mention this morning that, you know, there was, um, you know, coal miners of, of, you know, 60 to 65 that are going to retire. I'm only just that age. I'm only just getting started. We can't have people retiring at 60 years of age. Jeez, we, we just can't. Absolutely agree. You know, just getting started. Yeah. Um, but we have just just produced the Skills Road Survey. So we do a survey every year or about every year. It's not always on the dot. Uh, COVID sort of affected that. We read the first one in about 2018 or 19. We ran another one right at the start of COVID, stopped it and then continued on at the end of COVID so that we could, uh, not at the end, but at the first lockdowns in COVID so that we could try and get some variances there. And we we're fortunate to have 5,000 job seekers reply to a request for survey. We ask a range of questions. Um, for the first time this year, we actually had some mature job seekers as well. Traditionally, it's only been 15 to 24-year-olds, and for the first time, we had um, th years of 30 age and above job seekers. That's because we made some changes to Skills Road to incorporate mature job seekers, where traditionally the tools that were on there were only to help younger people transition from school into work. We felt that there was a looming skill shortage coming, and I'm sure that many of us remember back to a gentleman by the name of Bernard Salt, who had the in the in the 2000s there was the great australian man drought coming um we, we were fortunate and that's probably a sad word to use that we had we we had international terrorist acts that actually slowed down the economies across the world or we'd already be we'd already be suffering worse from skill shortages than we are right now we talk about in the employment side of things we talk about employers saying that they are, are suffering from skill shortages. Two questions, Dave. Is, could everyone just put their hand up, anyone who's suffering from labour shortages in their businesses? Just here. Now, now skill shortages, because they are different. Yep. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably a little low. When you, when you looked at the statistics, it's actually... So you guys are doing the right thing. You're probably already doing some of the recommendations that come in the skills, in the skills road report to do. What we do find, I'm supposed to be doing pressing buttons here. What we did find that the, the number one issue to stop, stop job seekers applying for jobs at the moment is mental health. Mental health issues, the fear about what's happening in the labour market. 20% of job seekers think that there's not enough jobs. We've all just talked about how that there's not enough people. We're get, not getting people to fill the jobs that we've got and yet one in five job seekers think that there's not a job. For the first time, job seekers are actually thinking about, about 50% of them are thinking about actually changing their career direction for a more secure job or a job that offers more flexibility. People aren't thinking about the money, they're thinking about security and flexibility in their workplace um, are, are much more important than just about earning higher levels of money. We, talked about, we talk about labour shortages and skill shortages. You know, one of the issues that we've got to come to terms with, well, what are the future skills? You know, young people and job seekers need to understand these, these uh, what are the skills that they have and what skills are valuable to employers. Some of the other fears from, from job seekers that we find are that they're not going to have the right skills to be able to work, even for an entry-level job. Their fears are that unless they've got 100% of the skills that they need for the job, they're not going to apply for it. So I think there's some work that we as employers can do around this, making it known. This is an entry-level job. Just come with the right attitude. We'll teach you the skills that you need because that's what a lot of the entry-level jobs like apprenticeships and traineeships, my, se my sector, are all about. Cadetships are the same as well. Um, it's, it's amazing to think that we have so many jobs available and yet we're not connecting people who are looking for work with them. 
employers have to start thinking about other ways of connecting with those job seekers. You know, connect in the, in, the, in the playground that the job seekers are looking for. If we think about younger job seekers, they don't watch television. They don't really look on Seek. They look in other things, social media. Um, you know, there's a whole range of other platforms that we need to start thinking about to attract young people. The jobs. I've seen job ads that say electricians start tomorrow. Um, that really doesn't, you know, not with not with people from this group, but I have seen jobs that say those type of things, you know, like we just start tomorrow. Um, there's tools that are available to employers to help them with writing the, using the right type of, type of language to actually attract people to their jobs. Women in non-traditional trades, you know, there's 4% uh, of females who left school start an apprenticeship and about 15% of, of boys did the same thing. There's a, whole, there's a whole half of the labour market coming through from school that a lot, of, a lot of industries aren't attracting. You know, I go back to one thing that I said a while ago. For the first time, people are thinking about changing industries. Right now is a great time for an employer to get in front of job seekers, talk to them about the benefits of their industry, how their industry has flexibility, um, you know, whether they're a small or a large employer and, and, and job seekers have a preference. One in, one in four people have a preference for working a large employer versus one in ten for small employers. But why is that? Why do, why do they think that a large employer will be, will be more beneficial to their career pathway than a small employer when there might be more opportunity? I think there's a, there's a whole range of opportunities here for employers to look at the Skills Road Report. It's just a lot of data that, that gives you insights to be able to use to better attract applicants for your roles, I think, anyway. Sort of covered that. You know, promote your jobs where job seekers actually are, not necessarily where you've traditionally, traditionally um, just advertised. Seek is, is a great tool uh, for some jobs, but not for all jobs. Get involved with your, with your high schools and your career advisors at high schools. Um, both employers say that Work experience is a fantastic opportunity for them to be able to see talent coming through and give people a taste of their career. Job seekers know that it actually helps them get work, but it doesn't happen. There's, there's, there's minimal numbers of, of uh, work experience opportunities taking up, taken up. Um, there is a national program, the National Work Experience Program, and the federal government funds both employers to, to trial job seekers when they've got real jobs. There's great opportunity here for employers to maximise the benefits that are out there from both federal and state governments to help try and overcome the skill shortages.